For the second part today, what I'd love to do is actually close up Ecotech and show you a very different tool that is also useful for doing this early analysis on the building performance, but I think it actually gives you an awful lot of very, very useful data to look at. So to work with this one, let me go back over the slides for just a second and introduce it. Okay. We're going to be working with a tool called Green Building Studio. Now, Green Building Studio is a little bit different than Ecotech. Ecotech is an application you install on your machine. Green Building Studio is actually a web-based service. So it's software as a service. And what it does in the background is it runs this DOE, Department of Energy 2.2 simulation for you. Okay, but you basically load your projects into Green Building Studio, you let it run it on the web, okay, and then it goes through and computes values and presents it to you in a web interface. So it starts in a very similar way. We're going to go ahead and take our Revit file and export a GBXML file, but we're going to then bring it into Green Building Studio. And to make that happen, what we need to do is actually install something called the Green Building Studio client okay, on our machine. And all that little client does is it helps us stay logged into the web service and upload files to that web service. But let us start, before we do that, just by creating a Green Building Studio account for you. And to do that, what you need to do is go to Internet Explorer or the web browser of your choice. And if you go to students.autodesk.com, And we log in. This is always interesting. Okay, let me see if I can remember what my password is over here. Nope, incorrect over there. Let me do it on the Mac side. I have it stored over there. I'm one of these people who can never remember my passwords. And so I have software to help me. Ah, miraculously, I've logged in. OK, and on this side, um, we can proceed to the download center. So again, log into this thing just using whatever you set up as your username and password there. What we're going to do is go to the download center. And Green Building Studio is now available. This actually just became available about a month ago. And it's really kind of an incredibly powerful and valuable tool. tool. So we can say Autodesk Green Building Studio. I can select my version. And all this is real. Yes? Um, if, you, if you download this using your email, yes. are you limited to one download? For this, for Green Building Studio? Or this and other Autodesk. No, actually, the way it works is, OK, you can actually in, you can download it as many times as you want. You can install it. The way it works is the first two installs, no one ever gives you any hassle. It's the third install where they start saying, hey, I noticed you've installed this a few times before. Okay. And it goes through Revit architecture. And yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. So. But it's, it's quite common to have to install it many times. As I keep on moving around between different machines and upgrading my operating system, you know, I'm on their hit list of people who install software too much. And you know, it's, if you get caught in the thing and it says, oh, you know, contact Autodesk customer support, just go through and you, you know, a little web form you fill in. Yeah, and you're back in, you're back in the game. Okay, great. It's, no worries. You're entitled to install it twice. The third time, then you sort of get yourself in trouble. But they, you can get yourself back out of it again. And then, yeah, this web service one, though, this is actually going to install it. And it's just going to be something you can access from any machine. When I say access Green Building Studio, what you're going to want to do is go through and register now. And when you register now, what it does is take you to a form where you can fill in all your information. So great. So go ahead and just type in whatever you are. Choose your language. Put in your password. Choose a security question. Okay, type in a few characters. Always to confirm that you're not a robot. 
Okay, and then um, go ahead and say what sort of updates you would like to receive. I tend to turn most of these off, but yeah, you know, depends how much you like to be bothered. <laughs> then go through and submit that. Okay, when you submit that, it should take you in and you'll get to a space where you can then start creating and uploading projects. Okay, I've already created an account, so I'm not going to recreate it. But go ahead and just at your convenience at home, whenever it makes sense, go through and create these things. Let me cancel out of that because I'm just going to log in using my account. And what will happen is it will open up and it will show you a list of projects. And chances are your list of projects are going to be very small right now because you just created your account. Okay. But once we have a list of projects, these are really just shells of information about the project location, oh, just all sorts of information about where it's located and what some default assumptions are about the building materials. We'll set that up. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go over to Green Building Studio and we're going to like uh, pull in kind of things using this uh, special, uh, or we're going to go to the B Green Building Studio client and pull in a GBXML file to analyze as part of this project. Let me start, let's go back to the slides for just a second. I'll push that down there for a moment. Close that up. Back over here. Okay, so the workflow is going to be we're going to create a model in Revit. We're going to export it as GBXML, just the same way as we did. Need rooms, need all those things set up. We're going to create a new project for ourselves in Green Building Studio. Then we're going to open the project and set up some defaults. Then we'll use this Green Building Studio client to upload the GBXML file. Okay. Now, as far as the Green Building Studio client goes, you can download it from their site to put it on your computer. If I come back over here, where is it over here? Let me try under downloads. There's this thing over here where, depending upon which software you're using, you can go through and it'll download Green Building Studio XML or the client. You know, we're not going to need to go through and do that right now because on most of these machines it has been loaded. What you can do for me, though, to help out is as follows. If you're sitting in Windows right now, go under the Start menu and take a look in the Start menu to see whether under Autodesk you see something called Green Building Studio Client or Desktop available. If you do see that, super. Your machine's already been set up. There's a couple machines that we probably didn't get it set up on during the first class. If you don't have that there, okay, if you're not seeing Green Building Studio Client, okay, we'll fix that in just a moment. If you do see it, why don't you go ahead and just open it? Okay, and you can say, okay, we'll talk about this in just a second. If you don't see that there and you would like to see that there, what you need to do is <coughs> as follows. Go to the computer, go to the K drive, and on the K drive you'll actually find an installer for the Green Building Studio client. So go to K, and then we'll go to the Green Building Studio client folder, and inside there you can just run, there's a little installer a setup program. Okay. And all that's going to do, it's a very small little program, it's going to install that on your machine. So if you're doing this from your own machine, you can download that from the website, or if you can connect to the K drive, you can pull it in that way. But just run that, and again, all this little piece of software does is it takes GBXML files and loads them up to uh, Green Building Studio projects. Okay. Most of you good in terms of Green Building Studio and the client? Most of you got it? A couple of you installing it or are you in pretty good shape? Good over here? Good on the front row? Okay. Then let's go ahead and proceed. And how we're going to do that is as follows. We're going to go back into the web interface. We go to uh, Green Building Studio. I'll log in on the PC side. Oop, 
I'm already logged in. What we're going to do is start by creating a new project. So click on the create a new project link. You're going to give your new project a name, oh, something ever so descriptive, like class 17, or no, it's class 2, actually session 17, class 2, part 2. You're going to choose a building type. The building type is really going to help it just by starting with making some assumptions about the use of the building. So as opposed to having to put in use assumptions, by saying that it is a courthouse versus a school building versus a library, certain assumptions about the occupancy and the hours of use will get loaded in. So you know, without having to specify that in a lot of detail, it'll just start by making some uh, good cho choices. And I'll say, let's go through and do a school building. We're actually going to work with that same little building that we did in the last class, okay? the one that had a sloping roof and a big window on the south side. Then we could choose the scheduling. This is the whole notion of really, is it 24-7? Is it 24 for five days a week? Is it 12 hours for a certain number of days a week? For schools, K-12 to schools seem to be open, but closed during the summers and holidays, or a year-round school. Like Stanford's more of a year-round school. We keep all the buildings running throughout the year. So I would say, let's go ahead and make it a year-round school. Okay. The next question is, is this an actual design project or is it a demonstration project? Leave it as demonstration. If you say actual design project, you'll get added to a list of real projects that other people will want to call you and ask you about, okay? Because they're interested in bidding on your work. Okay, so leave it as demonstration only for now and you'll avoid that. I'll say next. The next thing we're going to do is choose a location for our project. I could choose Stanford, California, and that would work out just fine. I'm going to choose something a little harsher because Stanford has such a mild climate again. I, I don't see the impacts here very much. So I'm going, to, I'm going to make it in Boston just so that it has a little more interesting data to work with. I'll say in Boston, Mass. You could actually type in a real address if you want to. There I am in the middle, middle of downtown Boston by City Hall. I'm actually going to all put myself over here on Beacon Street, over near the Common. Okay, so just go ahead and put yourself somewhere in space. It needs to put you somewhere in the earth. Okay, after you've located yourself, say this is my location. They always want you to confirm that that really is your location. The idea being, if you get a lot of data from this service, and it's all based on a completely wrong location, you sort of accepted liability for the fact that the data was based on a wrong location. Okay, so they like you to confirm that. After you choose a location, the next step is choosing a weather station. It's looking around to see what weather stations are nearby to this location. So I can choose some of these that are located nearby. It's recommending one that's pretty close by there. Let's we'll see what the story is there. I'll just go ahead and accept that. That looks pretty close. Uh, sort of a good question. I know that's a green building studio station. I don't know as opposed to the other weathers, or as opposed to the TM ones. Don't know that difference. The bottom one's closer. Is it? We'll choose that. The one that says Boston? Let's go for that. We'd like it to be as close as possible so that we really, you know, get the proper data. And you know, actually, you sort of experience that around here. There are real microclimates. You know, the Stanford climate is actually a little bit different than the climate down in like Cupertino or San Jose. It really is. We have a, a very particularly nice microclimate right here. Last but not least, we'll go through and it has the latitude and longitude. Here it's gone through and figured out what the utility rates are for electricity and for fuel, okay, based on sort of assumptions about Massachusetts, the state average. If you happen to know that you're in the district of a special utility, like you're generating power locally or you get special rates, okay, you can put in the dollar values that you want to use here as opposed to its averages. Okay, it does a good guess, but if you happen to know the specifics, put yours in. In fact, that's a general principle for all this stuff. It always guesses. It tries to make a, a smart assumptions, 
But if you know of a better value, put your value in, because then you get a more accurate analysis. The very final thing we have to do as we click Next is say that I am indeed authorized to use this service. You can only imagine how many lawyers worked on this to make sure that you're accepting all liability, you're accepting all the terms of use, and you promise never to sue them. Okay, so I'll say next to that. And lo and behold, finally, right there, we have our project. Session 17, class two, part two. Okay, it is a shell of a project. There's no geometry in here. It's really just the shell of a project waiting to be put together. Okay, before we do our first analysis, let's take a look at that and say, we'll take a look at some default attributes of the project. For example, when we bring in geometry, there's always a default wall type, there's a default window type, there's a default roof type, and it'll make its own guesses based <laughs> upon what would be appropriate for this climate. But if you would like to actually specify a specific type, you can. You can go to Project Defaults. And we can look at, oh, let's go to Spaces, for example. For the conditioning type, we could choose, for example, that if I want to specify that, I can say that it is going to be heated and cooled. For the space type, we can choose things like, oh, that it'll be, is it an auditorium or seating area, like a gymnasium or a motion picture theater? It's just giving you a finer level of control. So I'm going to say like it's a classroom building, because that's the one we sort of defined last time. There's some other things in here. The lighting power density, that has to do with the intensity of our lights. The equipment power density is all the power that's being consumed by all this stuff, all the computers and copiers and equipment. The sensible heat gain and the latent heat gain, that's related to those BTUs that are being generated as the off output of like these screens and the computers. So that's where you sort of encounter how many BTUs are sort of being gained through like all this equipment. So if I did it per person, That'd be sort of like saying that for, you know, there's one computer per person, and this is putting off so many BTUs. So we'd sort of encounter it that way. We can talk about the zones, and the zones sort of specify what we want the cooling and the heating set points to be. Or another good one is on surfaces, if you don't want to use the default assumptions for the wall types, you could, for example, choose the wall type and say that for the base, okay, only for the base, because you're going to be able to diff this as you look at different alternatives, I'll want it to be like, oh, a wood frame R13 wall. That's kind of a common wall for oh, kind of our climate here. Let me save all that stuff away. And, oh, even we had openings, if we wanted to specify default window types, more about the HVAC system. But that's probably enough to get us going. Okay, Having set up our project, we are now ready to take a GX, or GBXML file and put it in there to specify what the geometry is. So what GBXML file are we going to use? Let's go back over to Revit and take a look. I'll bring open Revit again. I'll say open, and I will go out to, where do I want to be? It's out on the L drive, session 17 in my folder, part two. So I say cats, go in, session 17, part two. You might recognize this building. We were working with it last time. That's OK that it's opened by several of us. OK, in this building, we had already set up the rooms. We had set up the room heights and things like that. So all I really need to do is go through and export the GBXML. So not much to do here in Revit, because I already put that together. I'll just say export it. Okay. There's the model. Simplify it a little bit. OK, two big zones. We got this sort of south-facing window. We have this big roof, which sort of slopes towards the north. <coughs> we are ready to export this thing. So if you export it, 
I'll go ahead and put that out. I can put it out there if I want. That's fine. Part two GB XML file, so I can identify it. I can close rev it up or just put it away off to the side for right now. Having put that off to the side, what I need to do now is actually open up the Green Building Studio desktop client. That's that little guy which is going to take our GBXML file and link it into our project. So in this client, what you do is you put in the username and ID that you use to sign into uh, Green Building Studio, and you log in. Once you log on in, it should present to you a list of the different projects that have been defined and are available to you. And then we can sort of say, take this GBXML file and load it into that project. Okay, so always create the project first and then go back. So you'll see I have a couple different projects here. I'll choose that one that we just created a few minutes ago. Okay, I can then browse through my GBXML file. And with that GBXML file and that project, I can now say create a new run. And when I create a new run, what it's going to do is actually load it into the web-based service and run an analysis on it. I'm going to try the view 3D RML, v VRML, see if that works. Hmm, not very interesting. Oh, there it is. It's actually there. I'm trying to do anything interesting at this thing. Oh, there it is. It's just being really slow. There you go. VRML is just a language that lets us sort of take simple 3D surfaces and just show them to you in environments like web. So you can see that actually this is the environment, or this is the model as it came in. Let me rotate it back down again a little bit. So that's the model file. That's just sort of confirming for you that that actually is the model that came through. It actually has a little legend here that shows you that the south surfaces are one color, the west surfaces are one color. It's showing you just a little bit about how the surfaces are coming in, just so you get a sense of really what that all is. But let me come back over here, and we'll leave it at that. Oh, actually, let me go back to the uh, Green Building Studio client, and we'll do it from there. <laughs> Having gone through and loaded in the GBXML, we can say create a new run. What it'll do is actually put this into the web service and it'll show up in the web interface instead. So it's bringing it in there, it's creating a run called part 2 GBXML, it's converting it to an energy plus file, then it's running the DOE 2.2 simulation. Okay, it's off there doing something in the background for us, creating some results. And let us take a look at what it tells us. At a high level, here's what it has to say. This building is 3,282 square feet. We think that the annual energy cost is going to be 9594 The life cycle energy cost will be about 130000 And that's based on, if you follow the asterisk, a 30-year life. And then applying a discount rate. So we're doing a little net present value calculation to try and bring that money about what's further in the future and what's closer in, yeah, and kind of give them an, a, yeah, an, uh, what, an accurate way of looking at that. We have sort of the total CO2 emissions per year, how much energy we're using per year. Let's kind of scroll on down. For the energy end use, we can see that for the electrical use, most of the electricity, 42% of it's being used by the air conditioning system, 28% by the lighting system. Okay, as far as fuel use, okay, about 65% of the fuel, that being gas or oil or whatever we're using to actually heat the building, is being used by the heating system. Where else do you use fuel in the building? That's pretty much it as far as I know. 
I'll think about that, whether there's something else that's using that. There might be some appliances or something like that. But yeah, I'm not sure where the other is. That's a good question. Ah, we clicked on it, and a very good question. <laughs> Space heating, pumps and auxiliary, and hot water. So hot water, those are sort of the biggest. I double clicked on that to get that result. How I actually get back is another issue. So other is broken up that way, HVAC. Oh, no, I take that back. I'm sort of curious on this one. What's other on electricity? Lights, pumps and auxiliary, space and cooling, fans, miscellaneous equipment. I guess it's showing you more detail. Okay. Based on the size, it's guesstimating about 79 people would fit in this space. Okay, it's giving us a little bit of information about what the recommended size of the cooling system is and the heating system. Okay, it's also showing us a little bit of information about what it's assigned to the different wall and roof surfaces. Okay, over here on this side, it's showing us that we're running the HVAC, we're running the air conditioning for mechanical cooling about 1,800 or 1,700 hours a year. Okay, it thinks that actually we could reduce that quite a bit by putting in more natural ventilation. Okay, so we can release the heat without having to mechanically cool it all the time. So it gives you an awful lot of data in here. Now, in terms of looking at this, okay, one thing is to sort of look at all this data and just take a minute to, you know, unpack it and really understand what it's telling you about the building. But this is its best assumption about really how the energy is going to be used right now. Let us try something a little bit different, though, in terms of actually sort of understanding how we can sort of use this information to guide our design. For example, okay, one very common thing is to go through and create what are called design alternatives. Okay, and in the design alternatives, we can do things like rotate the building, change the lighting conditions, maybe put different materials on the roof or the walls. And we can create those different design alternatives and compare them to our baseline. Okay, and that's a really good way to get started. So for example, let me come back over here. I'll just pop that up. I'll go to the Design Alternatives tab. And let's take a look at how you define some design alternatives. Okay. The idea is in this window, there's these little tabs on the bottom. And what you do is you make changes in these little tabs. Then we add them as alternatives and run the alternatives and see how things compare. It's a little backwards, but it works. Okay. So if I, for example, go through and let me try something really simple. I have that big old window facing to the south right now because I think that's buying me a lot of advantage. I'm gathering a lot of heat that's going to help keep the building warmed in the summertime, or in the wintertime, excuse me. Okay. It's actually keeping things warm during the summertime too, but we'll get to that in just a second. Let me try just rotating the building 180 degrees. Okay, just flip it around completely. Take a look, I'll give it a name. So big window faces north. I'll add that as an alternative. Okay, We haven't submitted it yet. I can actually define a whole bunch of different alternatives. I'll just do that first one first and see what happens. I'll say big window faces north. I will say run the added alternative. Let's see what happens. It's waiting in the run queue right now. It's actually running right now. The little spinning globe is telling me that. And what we're going to do is be comparing to the 95.94. Okay, we're going to see, actually, it's 96.07 right now. Let's take a look at why that is. If I go back and actually say back to the project runs up here in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a summary of those two different runs. The floor area stayed the same. The original energy cost actually got a little worse in this time. But it sort of happens in a funny way. The electricity cost actually dropped. It went from 6,800 to 6,200. The fuel cost actually got worse, though. It went from 2,700 to 3,300. So we actually have two different things working against each other. Okay, by shifting it, we're not getting the heat from the big window, okay, but we're also not getting that heat that's sort of uh, having to be cooled away during the summertime. Okay, so we sort of see with the peak energy, you know, in the toward the south, we have more electricity being used. Okay, and that's during the summertime to do the cooling. Okay, uh, 
fuel use, yeah, fuel use is worse when it's forced facing the north because we're not getting the heat there. Then we have this thing of sort of the energy use intensity. At some level, okay, these numbers have really been driven by the dollars. Okay, if you really look at it just in terms of how we're using BTUs per square foot per year, okay, there's two different scales there, and right now it looks like the base assumption, which is having the window towards the south, is actually it's more efficient in the scheme of things overall in terms of how we're using the energy and the performance of the building. Okay, it has a better efficiency. If you want to, you can do this. You can say, let me click on that one and let me compare to it. At which point, that zero, and I can see that just relative to that as the baseline. This is the second alternative has less electricity but more fuel, okay? And it's 8% higher in terms of its efficiency. Or I can flip it around the other way. So just whichever one you want to use as the baseline for your comparison, you can sort of flip them and kind of just reorient the numbers. Okay, so one thing is this whole thing about just sort of flipping and rotating the building. Okay, some other strategies we might use would be, oh, let's go back over to um, creating design alternatives. Maybe I would like to try an alternative that didn't rotate at a full 180 degrees. Maybe I'll try just rotating at 45 degrees clockwise. Okay. That's going to get it sort of out of the sun so greatly. Okay. I'll give that a name. I'll call this rotated 45 degrees. And I'll add that in as an, alter as an alternative. Okay. Now, I'd like to try some other alternatives too. How about this? We have those walls that are currently set up to be um, R13 walls, and we have sort of standard windows. What if we try just sort of really insulating the walls to a very high level? Okay, we could also go through and change the window types to sort of make sure they're not transmitting as much heat. And how we would do that is as follows. I'm going to create a new design alternative. What I'll say is for the walls, instead of using the existing construction, I'll change it to be Oh, how about a wood frame wall with super high insulation? And for the glazing, I'll even choose sort of a super insulated window. Okay, that's the northern wall. I can go through and change things for the southern wall too. You don't have to change all the walls the same. In fact, as you start really getting good with your design, you'll find out that you'll actually want different characteristics for different walls. But let me try changing those. I could also just change the total amount of glass on that wall, making like higher or lower amounts of glass overall. So again, I just did all that. I'll call that one, oh, super insulated walls plus windows. I'll add that as an alternative. Okay, got two of them waiting to submit. Let me run the alternatives. The nice thing is about these web services is you don't have to wait. You can sort of stack up five or six different analyses you wanted to do, go out and get some coffee, come on back later, and then take a look at the results. Okay, or shut down your computer and work on something else. Okay, so that's one of the nice things about software as a service is it'll quite quietly just run around in the background and when you log back in a little bit later, the answers will be there for you. Okay, we've computed some more things in here. Let's kind of take a look at what's going on. If I go back to the project runs, we can start to see that the numbers change a little bit in sort of subtle ways. Rotated 45 degrees. The total energy cost is actually worse here. What's happening here? Actually, let me orient it based to the baseline. Well, compared to the baseline, I'll do it that way. Okay, so if I rotating 45 degrees, what? The electricity is higher, the, the fuel is actually higher. So this was clearly not a good direction to head into compared to the baseline. Let's look at the super insulated walls. In the super insulated walls, the total energy cost went down. The electricity cost went up, but the fuel cost went down. Let's think about that. Okay, what happens, okay, the fuel cost going down sort of makes sense. We're not losing as much heat. Hopefully we're doing okay there. Super insulating the walls can have sort of a funny effect on the electricity cost though. In terms of what's going on, see we're using more electricity here. Two things could be happening. 
Okay. If you are generating a lot of heat inside your building, super insulating the building actually means that the heat's being trapped inside your building and it's not escaping. So you could actually be increasing your energy loads or your air conditioning loads as opposed to letting that heat dissipate. So it's kind of subtle. You really have to look at this very carefully to try and understand what the differences are. For example, if I go to the super insulated, I can see that it thinks it's running the air conditioning for 2,000 hours, and I think before it was like 1,800 or 1,900. So it's running the air conditioning for more hours. Okay, so there's all these sort of funny offsetting effects. Let me try just a few other things to show you before we have to break for today. And that is, not only can we play around just with these design alternatives for the materials to think about how the energy is being consumed, we could think about things like the water usage. Let's take a look at that. In the water usage, for example, it's estimating right now, based on this size of a building, that it's going to consume about 126,700 <laughs> gallons per year okay, for indoor and outdoor uses. Okay, and that's all going to be purchased from utilities right now. If I want to reduce the water consumption, because I want to just have less water consumed and maybe even get some lead points, I can do things like switch to low flow and waterless toilets and urinals. Okay, let me go ahead and re-estimate. You'll see that if I re-estimate, by just making those simple changes, I've actually reduced the total water usage by 17%. Pretty good for just changing some fixtures out. I really didn't have to do anything very active to the building at all. Okay, if I go a little bit further and I change the sinks from being standard sinks to low flow or hands-free, I can again reduce that even further. Hands-free sinks tend to work very well just because the water is never running when you're not standing there right in front of it. Okay, what did that reduce it to? Still 18%. Now let me save that away and show you in terms of lead compliance. Even though I've reduced it to 18%, I still haven't yet crossed a threshold that's going to get me any lead credits. So if you're thinking about trying to get lead certification, we don't quite have enough water saved yet. In terms of saving further, it looks like I could use <laughs> rainwater or gray water as possibilities for going through and further increasing the efficiency there. So let me go back over here. Let's try making some of those changes. What if instead, oh, we actually use some rainwater and we even reclaim the gray water like we do in this building? As an added bonus, let me just change it to native landscaping. That's sort of a generally good thing to do. Why put all these sort of uh, unusual plants that require a lot of irrigation? If you can use zero escape and things that are actually local to the area, you save an awful lot of water. So I'll say estimate it and save it. Let me go back over to the lead water efficiency. Okay, by putting in gray water and rainwater, we actually reduced our consumption to 88 or by 88%. Okay, which ultimately led to like four lead points. Okay, so the idea with a tool like this is to sort of give you some guidance. Okay, maybe I should think about a rainwater system. Okay, I could turn off the rainwater collection system and sort of see what the points are and really figure out what's going to be appropriate to you. Hey, yeah, Connor. So do I like pull on just the worst design ever and like, oh, well, I kind of made it a little bit better and it doesn't have so now the lead pool is Nah, actually there's a baseline case of exemptions, and then you're, you're comparing the baseline. So, you know, good try, but not quite. Okay. Final thing is this whole notion of solar energy. Actually, it's not the final thing. It's just one more that I want to kind of show you. Solar is one where it sort of really demonstrates this whole notion of really the value of putting it into a tool like this. It's factoring in the efficiency of the panels and the cost of the panels, and it's really giving us recommendations showing us of all the surfaces on the building, really, what is the return in annual savings per square foot that we'll achieve by putting photovoltaic panels on them? And then based on a payback period that we want to put in there, some limit, like 50 years, okay, we can actually sort of say what the annual energy cost savings is and really how long it's going to take the system to pay back. So, yeah. Well, and that's sort of a good issue about sort of really, you know, what is the life of the panels now? Do you have a good estimate for what the effective life is? Not 50 years. Nah, I think you're probably right there. Okay. If it's 10, let's, if, 
If it's 20, the problem is, watch this. If you say that it's 20 in terms of what you're needing, the truth is, yeah, we really can't do it. If we just put it on the absolute maximum efficiency surfaces, you know, it would take 29 years to pay back that system. So that's kind of a good issue in terms of really whether photovoltaic, pa photovoltaic panels are really a useful thing, at least economically. They may be a perfectly valid thing from an environmental standpoint and reducing our carbon footprint, but if you're looking at it strictly in terms of payback based on the utility costs, maybe not. But then again, maybe this is just for Boston because the, maybe the fuel here is very, very low. If we move to other parts of the environment where, or other parts of the world where electricity is more expensive, okay, it changes the whole equation very radically. And that's just the complexity of just that very issue is why these tools are so useful because there's really no right answer and it depends on all these factors and it's really a lot of work to do this calculation. But tools like this let you sort of get to very quick answers relatively simply. Okay, so that you can then use this as a starting point for your analysis and really say, okay, these two roofs are pretty good surfaces. I can think about whether I want to do anything with the walls, but it, it's just supposed to be guiding your design. Okay, so let's just go ahead and leave it there because that's actually sort of a perfect spot. Where you fit this thing into the whole scenario is really just giving you some quick feedback that you can then use really as the starting point for your investigation and you kind of keep on pushing it further. Okay, beautiful. Let us break there for today. When we come on back on Thursday, we're going to shift our focus again, and we'll be looking at quantities and how we can actually, from a model, extract construction quantities and start thinking about the cost of a building, but just a, another application of trying to use the model and analyze it.